Steve, let me start by thanking you for taking the time to talk with me today. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks. I really am so excited to have you as part of this project. And um, as we were mentioning earlier, really you have expertise in interpersonal communication that spans so many of the different subjects that are captured within the book. Um, but in particular, I was interested in, in hearing about your research on language, okay. um, such a central part of what we do in interpersonal communication. And you've looked at it from lots of different perspectives, really. And I'm interested, first of all, in how you came to study language or what drew you to a career in communication and interpersonal communication research and teaching. Okay. Well, I think I was thinking about that question. So as an undergraduate, I was a political science major and a communication minor. And like a lot of folks, I think, of my generation, I also was a debater. Mm -hmm. So that was an activity that was... We would travel seven or eight months of the year every other weekend all over the country. And the one thing that that exposed me to was faculty, you know, in a one on one or small group kind of setting, where I had much more exposure to faculty than just sitting in a class with 25 or 200 students. So I thought originally I wanted to be a debate coach. That's why I went to graduate school. Okay. And then about a year of that in graduate school, and I realized um, this was, I was tired of traveling. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also realized that part of what I enjoyed was the kind of ongoing relationships that I had formed with the debate coaches as an undergraduate or uh, it, with the, the faculty that I was working with as a graduate student. I realized that those interpersonal relationships were really something that was important in my life and what made things significant, and so that was part of it. Now, you mentioned language. Um, I think I was blessed to have a number of teachers in graduate school that probably could make about anything interesting, but they could make certain problems interesting. So uh, both Brant Burleson and Linda Putnam were people who think that fall into that category for me. And one of the things I can remember in the introductory theories of interpersonal communication class, uh, Brant talking about speech act theory mm -hmm. and talking about um, just the basic question of how is it we're not only able to say things with words, but how can we do things with words, and how do we know what each other is doing? And that might seem like, an, A, an obvious question, although when you unpack it, it's not, and B, a fairly, what, um, abstract question, mm -hmm. uh, but it turns out it has, that's a question that has significance, everyday significance. So, um, okay, what do I mean by saying and doing? We talk about topics. Okay, so we might talk about things like um, your new book. We might talk about what your boys are doing. We might talk about my youngest who's graduating from high school in about a week. Um, so those, are, those would be topics that we would talk about. But we not only, won't, with, when we are conversing, we are not only saying things, we're doing things. So we're making promises or we're making requests or commands or making suggestions or giving advice or... Uh, complementing one another. And, and the question that uh, John Searle, a philosopher of language, raises, how is it that we do that? How is it that uh, it's possible to do things with words and to know what other people are doing? And so he talked a lot about um, sort of preconditions that uh, are associated with any of those acts. Um, so we're in a room right now, we're talking. Um, there's a, you can't see it on the camera, but there's a door over there. Uh, if we imagine, okay, that door is, let's say it's open and there's noise in the hall. Mm -hmm. And I say, Denise, do you think we should shut the door? Now, on the face of it, I mean, I've talked about topics. I've talked about a door, for example. Mm -hmm. And I've asked you a question about literally what you think. But you probably realize pretty quickly, he's not just asking me what I think. He's making a suggestion here that we might want to shut the door. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's some sort of need in the situation that, uh, that uh, one of the things about requests or recommendations is there's some sort of need in the situation that would suggest that something needs to be done. Um, there's also, Cyril talked about a need for the, the act itself. So if it's noisy and you stand up and you walk over there and you're starting to shut the door and I say, Denise, you, would you shut the door? Or do, you, do you think we should shut the door? You probably look back at me like, can you not see what I'm doing, right? Um, so there's also a need for the act itself that's presumed by, the, by doing it. Um, ability and willingness are the possibility of them are presumed. So um, if we're walking out of the conference and I'm carrying papers and uh, they blow under a car that's uh, parked on the side of the, the hotel and I say, Denise, could you lift that car up so I can get my papers? 
Um, again, you would probably look at me like, what is he talking about, right? Because there's no, that's something that isn't plausible that you're able to do. Willingness, the same thing. So with students, um, students may ask me, um, could I get the review sheet? Could we get the review sheet for an exam maybe a week before the exam? And I'd say, sure. And then they say, could we have all the answers to the questions that will be on the exam? And then I look at them and, and laugh. And we both know that they're not requesting at that point because I'm, I wouldn't be willing to do that. They know it, I know it, they know that I know it, etc. cetera. So they, by, by those conditions, they are communicating in a way that both of us are aware that what they appear to be doing is not what they're doing. Okay. And sincerity would be another condition Cyril talks about. So this, if, you, if you said um, you got tired of me talking here and you said, Steve, go jump in a lake, um, I know you're not serious typically unless there's a body of water and I'm wearing a swimsuit and whatnot. So um, conditions that in, in the situation and also things that we've talked about leading up to that, our knowledge of those helps us recognize what's going on and what we each are doing. Now, that's, so that's part of how Cyril answers this sort of philosophical question. And I, I mean, like I said, good teachers can make philosophical questions interesting. So part of what got me was just this was something interesting to think about. But it also has um, implications for just, you know, how we function, how we get along. Oh, so. I think actually, I mean, your examples hit what to me is so magical about communication, is that we're able to understand those interactions with so much complexity in the situation that could be influencing how we interpret it. And it allows us to do things like make sincere comments, but it also allows us to use sarcasm. Humor. So if you ask me yeah. to get the papers out from under the car, and I'm wearing them, <laughs> I can say to yeah. you, sure, Steve, I'll just lift up the car. Yeah. And yeah. We, have, we can have that kind of exchange. And right. it allows for this tremendous level of, of understanding and you know, Closeness I have a special interest too. in conflict, so it also explains this misunderstanding yeah. because I actually meant for you to lift up the car, yes. and you think that I'm kidding. Right, exactly. And so exactly. you've really hit on what is so fascinating about our ability to use language and extract meaning and misunderstanding right. from it. Right, yeah, and I think, I think part of what interests me, and this is sort of, you were talking about connections between the chapters, um, I'm very interested in politeness, which is um, covered in both the chapter on language and also the chapter on interpersonal influence. Mm -hmm. And I, again, these conditions that I was talking about, um, they part of competence, just interpersonal competence, is being aware of the potential of what you're implying about yourself and the other person as you are doing various mm -hmm. things. So I was thinking, I was trying to think about examples of this again. And my office at Purdue is right next door to um, Howard Cyphers, who's our department head. Mm -hmm. And I've been there more than a decade. And so I, I, rightly or wrongly, I think I have a pretty good idea about what's going on in the department. So I, I am not shy about walking into Howard's office and saying, Howard, I think you need to think about this. Or Howard, I, need, I think you need to uh, consider doing this. Um, but again, those are absolutely, if we call them, I don't know, advice or recommendations, they presume certain things. They presume. I know what's going on. They presume he might not know what's going on or might not be considering it in this situation where it's relevant. Mm -hmm. um, it presumes that um, he wasn't already going to do what I'm suggesting or there's no need for me to suggest it. So it presumes certain things about him, potentially, um, well if I do it constantly, we know that people give advice constantly sort of look like a know-it-all or you know, that sort of thing. And, and if I go in and give him advice constantly about things he's not doing right, he may come to the impression that I don't think he's doing a great job. And so, um, and I, there's been, he's, we're, we have a good relationship, a good working relationship, so I can give advice pretty freely. But there have been a couple situations where I realized, I've pushed the boundaries here. I, I, I have said something where I can see I've gotten him, I've pushed too far, I've gotten him mad or something. And so, again, I think competence especially is, um, what you're working for is at least knowing when that possibility exists. So I'd like to know what you think about what communication researchers are working on now, or what you're working on as you look toward the future. Okay. Um, well, I thought maybe I'd just talk about one project, okay. and, because I think it does connect some of the different areas, again, in your book, the, the chapter on families the chapter in influence and the chapter in language, at least those three. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I think you know I have six children and stepchildren. Mm -hmm. So the youngest is 18 and the oldest is 32 in my stepson. And he has uh, been in the Army or the Army Reserve 
uh, for more than a decade now, and he's been deployed twice to Iraq. So I have an interest, a personal interest, in the impact of military deployment on families. But I also, uh, there's a center on campus at Purdue called the Military Family Research Institute, and uh, a human development professor, Shelley McDermott, runs that center, and she's very well known in this area, and um, has invited me to get involved in some interdisciplinary projects there. Um, the initial ones, looking at some of the programming they were doing with children whose parents had recently returned from deployment, because these kids often, their friends don't understand what they're going through, um, because they aren't, they, they're not military families, and they, they don't quite understand the issues about separation and danger. But, um, but also, so we've done some evaluation of their programming and some interviewing with kids and adolescents, but the newest project we're working on is looking at family members talking with service members when they come back about potential concerns about mental health. So there's been a lot of um, coverage in the news about issues about PTSD or anxiety, depression, or even traumatic brain injury in terms of returning service members that come back and may have some challenges in terms of readjusting to family life and to, to work and, and just to being in social situations. And, um, and so there, actually the way I got the idea for working on the project was listening to a presentation at a conference by a, a, a psych psychiatrist named Stephen Sayers who works for the Veterans Administration and he has a program called Coaching into Care where family members can call in and say I have some concerns about my service members mental health I think they would benefit from talking with somebody but they're resistant right. and so what do I do okay and I thought this is fabulous because this is very you know it's very important right but it also it's about influence and it's about identity and, and it's about all those things that are presumed by, for example, giving advice, the kind of thing we were talking about before. So we're trying to recruit um, through what are called family readiness groups, and those are um, groups of family members um, where um, they provide support while that service member is going to each other, um, and also you know, reintegration issues after they return. Mm -hmm. um, and with us, with a survey, because that you have these people calling the hotlines and they're giving advice based on sort of models of motivated interviewing and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But when I talked with Sayers about do you, what do these conversations look like, there's nobody that's really studied that question mm -hmm. directly. And so we're trying to um, look at um, what are some of the uh, goals that people have, family members have, when they would approach a situation like this. What do they see as the likely obstacles? And again, it ties together a lot of things. Um, we know that mental health is stigmatized, and so this is a tough issue to talk about. To, to say that there may be some issues that where you should might benefit from seeing a mental health professional can really imply some potentially um, stigmatized things about that person. Um, the military itself is a culture that emphasizes strength and um, not focusing on problems and sort of a masculine approach to just you know hang in there and don't tell other people about any problems you're having. Um, and, um, and there's also a lot of doubts about uh, or skepticism about the efficacy of, of mental health care mm -hmm. in this population. So there's a lot of issues to have this conversation that potentially could come up. So we're looking at, um, we're asking uh, family members who've had somebody return recently, um, have they had this conversation? And also giving them kind of a scenario, a, a hypothetical situation, saying if you were in this situation, you were seeing the service member do this, would you talk to that person? And if you did, what would you say? And then looking at some, you know, how direct are they and how do they try to manage the issues about identity and what sorts of way, how are they trying to overcome obstacles? Um, and also, uh, what are the goals? So what, you know, what goals do they see as relevant to the situation and sort of taking those, looking at connections there. I would love then to turn it around and then give some different messages back to service members and say, if yes, what would, how persuasive is this? How, um, how uh, supportive is this? Mm -hmm. uh, how much implied criticism is there here? Or even just things. what do you think they're trying to do? Yes. Back to the notion yes. of the Speech Act. Yep. Because there's so much complexity in that situation right. and what a context in which language and words really matter. Yep.
So Steve, we don't have a lot of time left, but what advice would you have for these students as they think about potential careers in communication? Yeah. I, I was thinking about that question because I, I, I mentioned my own kids. With so all your kids. I'm, I'm watching <laughs> them and have watched them make those decisions and work through some of those issues. But um, I was, okay, two or three things and just broad recommendations. One is, is really, I think the um, focus of your book is a good focus in terms of uh, to, uh, being a communication major ought to mean that you become familiar with a number of theories that you can apply to situations. And uh, they're not going to tell you exactly what to do in that situation, but they're going to give you a way of thinking about the situation that um, highlights certain things that might not have been immediately evident or might not have been um, uh, apparent to somebody who had not done a good deal of that sort of thinking. Okay, so I know students often will say, I want application, I want something that's practical, um, but I do, I like the focus of the book and I like the, the emphasis on thinking about frameworks that can help us um, analyze situations, analyze cases, and give us insights, and it's good practice you know, to do. So that's, that's one. Um, and again, I think just lots of practice of speaking and writing in lots of situations, including for different audiences through different media, including new media, etc. Um, I think finding a some sort of content specialization can be important. Um, I was thinking about this in the context, I know most of the students in this class are not going to go to graduate school or be a professor, but I think it works in both of these contexts. I did not start out studying military families at all, mm -hmm. at all. I didn't have a clue that that's where I would end up. Um, I was studying issues about language and identity, and I had to do a good deal of reading to get up to speed and, and talking with people who had made that career to be able to get up to speed to be able to interact with, with researchers in that context and with families in that context. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, there's something similar in terms of whether it's healthcare or politics or entrepreneurship, a lot of universities have that now as a certificate or nonprofit organizations, but finding something that um, you are passionate about um, a minor, some sort of immersion experience through internship where you develop some expertise in an area. I think where you can bring your analytic skills, but you also know about that as an area, I think is a good way in the door. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. That's great advice.